Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Welcome to everybody joining us live, as well as those that will be joining us afterwards. Welcome to this 11th episode of FIP's digital program on the development goals, setting goals for the decade ahead. And today's episode is about digital uh, development goal number seven, advancing integrated services. Let me introduce myself. My name is Marit Ekstien. I'm currently employed with the South Pharmaceutical Society of South Africa. I'm also an executive committee member of the FIP education, education, uh, educational pharma pharmacy sector of FIP. And I'm the global lead for advancing integrated services, FIP development goal seven. I would like before we begin to make and share with you a few announcements and housekeeping rules to make your experience more favorable. This webinar is recorded and live streamed via YouTube. The recording will also be available on the FIP website, which is www.fip.org. You may ask your questions in the question box, the Q&A box provided on this webinar. You're also welcome to provide your feedback on to webinars at FIP.org. If you'd like to become a member of FIP, you can access the information at FIP.org forward slash membership underscore registration. Please note that all attendees will receive a certificate of attendance via email. Let's begin by briefly introduce you to the digital program, Setting Goals for the Decade Ahead. So this digital program, Setting Goals for the Decade Ahead, is FIP's 2021 digital program on the FIP development goals. It is in the next slide, you'll see a comprehensive online event series, which provides coverage of the 21 goals in 21 events during 2021. The main aim of the 21 development of uh, digital events is to mobilize the global pharmacy development and transformation through the development goals by engaging our profession members and colleagues everywhere, we aim to provide a description, direction and context for each specific goal. Monitoring and evaluation through data evidence and identifying priorities across practice, science and workforce and education is also part of this program. This program also coincides with the World Pharmacy Week in September. The 21 events run between March and September of this year, with an average of two events per month, as you can see on the screen, and a particularly busy September, which coincides with World Pharmacy Week and specifically World Pharmacist Day on 25 September. You can pre-register for all events by visiting events.fip.org. We encourage you to do so, and we look forward to having you in our upcoming events. Well, back to today's event, I would like to share the outcomes of this episode with you, as you can see on the screen. It will be important that everybody attending will be able to describe and explain the components of FIP Development Goal 7 and its three elements, namely workforce and education, science and practice. Secondly, to showcase the FIP tools, evidence and resources to support DG7's implementation across all three elements to identify priorities across practice, science, workforce and education within 
the development goal seven. And also to encourage our members in the activities to support mentoring and evaluation of this goal through data evidence. It is my privilege to introduce our panel of speakers today. Firstly, we have Bob Buckham, who is uh, the National Program Manager for Integrated Community Pharmacy Services at the Central Technical Advisory Service in New Zealand. Secondly, we have Barbel Holbein. She is my co-lead for DG7, Integra Advancing Integrated Services, and she's also a lecturer at the University of Brenham. Thirdly, we've got Lars Alke Sudeland, who is the president of the Community Pharmacy Section of FIP, and he is from Sweden. And lastly, we have Jacqueline Chirug, who is currently a vice president of FIP and also the president of the previously president of the hospital pharmacy section. I will read out a little bit more about each of them when I introduce them prior to their presentations. Before we hear from our speakers, we want, quickly want to remind you of the FIP development goals and that they were launched in September 2020 as the one FIP goals that brings together pharmaceutical practice, science, and workforce and education. As per our vision and mission, FIP believes that we can have no pharmaceutical care without a pharmaceutical workforce. And we can have no pharmaceutical care without a scientific foundation for the next decade. So as I've mentioned in the introduction, FIP development goals are 21 development goals that build on the 13 workforce development goals that was launched in 2016. In the next slide, you will see the full range. FIP uses the same consensus-based approach to expand the goals into a set of 21, each reflecting elements of practice, science, and workforce and education. Let's watch a next short video to see the 21 goals in action. Uh, we cannot hear. Can you please start sharing again the slides?
thank you for that video. And this then brings us to today's episode, which will focus on goal number seven, advancing integrated services. And to kick off this academic program, I'm happy to introduce our first speaker, Bob Buckham. Bob, as I've mentioned, is the National Program Manager for Integrated Community Pharmacy Services at the Central Technical Advisory Service, a professional service organization providing strategic advisory and program management services for New Zealand's district health boards. Bob's practice background in the hospital pharmacy, specializing in medicines information. But recently, he has held national lead roles in policy and advocacy for peak professional pharmacy organizations in New Zealand and Australia. In 2017, he was the project lead for the partnership between the Pharmaceutical Society of New Zealand and the New Zealand Medical Association to establish an agreed methodology for designing and implementing new services or models of integration patient-centered care. The resulting framework identified evidence-based elements in implementation, science, interprofessional collaboration, and person-centered care. Bob, thank you for being with us today, and we're looking forward to learn more from your presentation. Thank you very much, Mariette. It's a pleasure to be talking to colleagues around the world and um, greetings from New Zealand. Uh, to begin with, on my first slide, look, trying to define what integrated care means, there, there are numerous definitions and there are different purposes and from different perspectives. And while I may be taking quite a simplistic view of integrated care and what it means and what it may involve, I don't want to play down the, the considerable body of evidence and information that goes along with all these different models and practices that are occurring around the world. When we talk about integrated care, there's a risk that we can get overcomplicated with the discussion, but there does need to be a, a shared understanding of, of what we're meaning. And so integrated care may, may depend on the type of inter integration. It could be organizational or professional, the level of what the integration is occurring. So whether it's at a individual practitioner level or whether it goes more systemic across a health service, um, a health system how we process, what the process of integration involves, how care is organized and managed and information is shared, and also the breadth of that integration, whether it's, a, it's an entire population or whether we're just looking at quite specific defined population cohorts. And so when you read about integrated care, there are all kinds of different meanings to what integrated care may involve. If we move on to the next slide, the, as well as the definitions of integrated care, there are many models of integrated care. And so for individual models, they may be as simple as individual care plans, which are shared between two clinicians, a pharmacist and a general practitioner, for example. It involves the patient-centered medical home or case management. And then we can get into group or disease specific models, a chronic care model or pathways of care. And then maybe we have integrated care models looking at specific conditions such as diabetes and what is the, the spectrum of care from, from screening through to primary care services through to secondary care and specialist services and what occurs at each level. And there are also population models for many pharmacists uh, working in clinical settings, often it is around how they are sharing and they are interacting with the other clinicians or healthcare providers with looking after their shared populations. As a 
incredible source of information around integrated care. The International Foundation for Integrated Care has its own journal, its own publications, its resources, its forums, which are incredibly valuable for finding out more about the different ways that integrated care is being provided and the science behind the different systems. The foundation have said that our healthcare, health and care systems are fragmented, disease-centered, difficult to navigate, and do not consider the whole person. As a result, too many people experience poor quality care, often in the wrong settings, with undesirable outcomes, which speaks to how if we orientate the services and the care that we're providing to what we as providers think should be best for us or what works best for us without the needs of the person that we're providing care to as the centre of what is being provided, then we can really lose out the benefit of the, the best possible care to the people that we're providing that health care to. And next, that takes me to this quote that I found from the National Voices in the United Kingdom and the document and narrative for person-centered coordinated care. And this is from the, the patient or the consumer's voice, their perspective to what they are wanting from us as providers. I can plan my care with people who work together to understand me and my carers, allow me control and bring together services to achieve the outcomes important to me. And so when we're talking about person-centered care, having that voice in the middle of what we are doing and what we are deciding and discussing is a really important aspect to, to get things right. So moving on to our New Zealand example, we, and a few years ago now with our health strategy, we had wonderful governmental policy support for the role of pharmacists and expanding the role of pharmacists and optimizing what pharmacists can offer patient care and the health system as a whole. The government's health strategy stated to perform at a high standard. It, the system needed more than just skilled workforce and resources, it needed a shared view of its purpose and the direction that it was going, combined with effective ways of working. The one team to support health and well-being was what was commonly presented. Policy po priority for New Zealand governments has been to identify and address health inequalities. We have considerable difference in, differences in health outcomes in our indigenous Māori population and with Pacific peoples and the need to look at different ways of providing care with the, need, with the need to address these inequalities has been a considerable focus. So as the pharmacy profession, we were looking to expand our role, develop new services, identify new ways that pharmacists could be providing better frontline care and every time we found that we were submitting a policy application or a submission to for a new service or one of these new roles, we always struck opposition from our medical colleagues. And often this opposition was poorly described. It, it didn't demonstrate good understanding of what pharmacist practice involves, of what pharmacist knowledge and skill is, is there and so it was a challenge to try to progress these services particularly where we were seeing uh, all these wonderful services being implemented overseas the the medicines use reviews uh, minor ailments type services and the, the the second barrier to to implementing these services were was the need to try to convince our service commissioners or funders who had limited resources to, to invest in, in an unknown service or to try to translate evidence from overseas jurisdictions and different healthcare systems, what that might 
translate to to our small country here. But medication is the most common intervention in healthcare, and so the roles and the responsibilities of the prescriber and the pharmacist are intrinsically linked. Whatever we look to do as a profession with medicines has a, an effect or a connection to other health professions, and particularly prescribing professions, and particularly medicine. So for the peak organisations for pharmacy and medicine in New Zealand, the Pharmaceutical Society and the New Zealand Medical Association, we asked ourselves the question, how do we develop and implement some new services or some models of integrated person-centred care that also helped have closer collaborative practice between the two professions? and not just an organization level, at individual practitioner level. In the next slide, thank you. As we developed this project, we, we discovered that we needed to agree to some principles of what integrated pharmacist doctor care looked like. And these were the, the principles that we, we came up with. And it, and it notes that all care must be patient-centered and it recognizes that uniqueness of an individual's health needs. Someone with diabetes is different to someone else with diabetes or Parkinson's disease or whatever their needs are, their experience is unique and we need to work to that uniqueness. We also acknowledged publicly in this as a policy type statement that we have our own unique skill and expertise and we have different influences in terms of how we can come to integrate what we do together and also there's sustainability requirements for this so service funding and sustainability of funding and being able to successfully implement these services was an important aspect to each profession. And what we believed at that time was a, was a wonderful, uh, successful outcome for us was an acknowledgement from our medical colleagues that, that pharmacists prescribing is, is an important aspect of what pharmacists are able to offer. Thank you, next slide. So with the range, the vast range of, of evidence and guidelines and documents and white papers and grey papers and, and whatever colour papers there are existing at the moment around integrated care, we look to try to bring a range of different definitions and the factors, enablers, strategies and influences that relate to person-centred care, what improves or helps support pharmacist and doctor collaboration and there's some wonderful studies around that and also health service design and implementation implementation science because one aspect was that we had witnessed here in New Zealand is that we might have a new service become available or, or have funding become available but having it successfully implemented in, in pharmacies required a whole other change management process to, to support pharmacists to, to deliver the service successfully and to integrate it as part of their practice. So our aim was to create a framework methodology so that individuals or groups of pharmacists and doctors, along with service commissioners or funders, were able to explore their ideas, uh, find out what needs were occurring within their communities, what innovations might help address those needs and then to think through the factors and influences to plan and develop something that might be a successful and sustainable service model. Next slide. Thank you. Go, going through the process of developing our, our healthcare framework actually when we looked back on it and reflected upon it, it, it demonstrated 
those enablers of collaboration between our two professional organizations. Our, our working group had uh, some of the leadership from the two organizations and the discussions that we had, we could see that there was greater understanding forming. They could understand what pharmacist practice involved, what the knowledge involved, where our training uh, comes from, and also the, the language and the phrasing that is used in, in medical practice and even the, the word diagnosis, which is, can be um, quite controversial when pharmacists use it because it has a different meaning for, for doctors. We we're able to talk through some of that. So it, it, was, a, it was a positive experience to be able to work together to, for, on something that was going to enable our, our practitioners to work together. The, the roadmap or the, the framework that we came up with wasn't intended to provide all the answers, but it allows people who are using it to explore the, the areas that they needed to, to understand uh, what they might need to do to, to create this, this person-centered and integrated service model. And it was, it was intended to be collaborative. It is a collaborative discussion. It, is, it explored and, and progressed and particularly with um, with patients or consumers as, as part of that discussion. So that it's, a, it's a successful design of what is trying to be achieved. Uh, so, and then we, we worked through some of the examples that were coming up um, or had already occurred in, in our practice here in New Zealand and allowed thinking to develop around how would this have looked and one example was the reclassification of trimethoprim from a, a prescription medicine to pharmacist only. We have the pharmacist only category. And that was something that was just successful that we're able to, to put through a reclassification process despite any opposition. But then when we reflected back through our framework, we could see better ways of how that work might have been done in a more integrated sense to to link in with community pharmacists and general practitioners and how they would share information and to share the care for people who were, were seeking to access this medicine. And next the the framework model itself without going through all the detail of it, uh, people are welcome to access from the, the web link there has um, six components to it that um, sort of summarize what I've, what I've covered around how uh, a group, a collaborative of people can identify all the different factors that they might need to be thinking of and how they progress those. And also thinking about for some pharmacists, their, their care or their, their working um, relationships can be very collaborative for in, in hospital practice, for example, up on a ward, the pharmacists and the doctors are literally working by, side by side quite often. Whereas in some communities, uh, a, a pharmacist and a general practitioner might be at some physical distance or they might be co-located. So the different ways of thinking of how a service might work best for those different settings, the framework hopefully allows them to, to think through those processes. And then finally, I, I just wanted to um, finish with, with this slide to, to take, a, a, again, a, a very simplistic look um, at how um, we work, a simplistic look at integrated care and integration of pharmacy in primary health care is how we can work together as one team to achieve the best outcomes for the populations we provide care to and our practitioners, our practitioners and teams need the, this range of understandings and it's the, a shared understanding of the health needs, goals and priorities of the patients we're providing care to and this is guided by the patient. We need shared discussions and decision making about what those best solutions or plans might be to achieve these. And again, this is guided by the patient. It's not us coming up with a solution and saying, here we go. It's exploring those ideas together. It's a co-design approach. 
we need shared understanding and recognition of our respective professional knowledge and skills. We know each other and we have a willingness to work together. We also are connected and we're communicating all the time. And it's not just individuals, it's our teams that we're working alongside, the entire pharmacy team. There's also needs to be a shared desire and leadership within the team again as approached, but also across the professional organizations just to demonstrate that this, there's this shared vision for working together and that we have a shared accountability for the care to the people that we're providing healthcare to. And also it's important to, to acknowledge that there's different issues, needs or accountabilities from each of these participants in this discussion around integrated care. For From a clinical basis, there may be clinical goals that we're seeking to achieve. How do we measure for those? What are the indicators that those are being achieved? Whereas perhaps for a service funder or the commissioner, they are also interested in, in healthcare goals, but they might be having other uh, they have their own sets of accountabilities, shall we say, and they will want to know that perhaps their investment is is providing benefit. So how do we how can we factor those into the design and the delivery of this new model that we're looking at? We need to have um, co-design and we need to have integrated funding to enable to happen so that we're not competing, we're not disadvantaging either of the participants and we need shared incentive incentivization so that we can all be working to achieve the best possible outcomes so it's a system that provides a, a structure processes policies and funding um, that allows all the factors to be considered and it includes the patients and communities that we are looking to provide this care to and so that's it's a somewhat perhaps overly simplistic view of, of integrated care, but uh, it allows a simple discussion between people looking to progress new models and uh, think of the, the complexity of the evidence and information behind that um, in, a, in a more progressive and step-by-step and -step way. So Thank you very much for, for listening and I look forward to taking your questions later. Thank you very much, Bob, for um, sharing this very important um, aspect of integrated care. And I think reminding all of us that um, we should maybe listen more often or we, we don't already do that to the patient when it comes to integrated service and just maybe not um, always to um, follow the direction we think it's important. Um, so thank you so much for sharing with us that. Um, colleagues, um, now moving forward um, with our program, now that we have a, a great introduction to the session, we're gonna focus on the three elements of development goal seven. We're going to look at the workforce and education, the practice, as well as the science. And let me give you an overview before I introduce the speakers. When we talk about workforce and education in terms of integrated services that we want to advance, um, it is a patient-centered and integrated health services foundation for workforce development relevant to social determinants of health and needs-based approaches to workforce development. When we look at the practice side of this goal, it's a people-centered and integrated healthcare provision that is based on an interprofessional and cross-setting seamless continuum, including pharmacist delivered professional services. And if we implement the science element to this goal, it's the scientific strategies to evaluate expanded professional pharmacy services and programs, including translational and reverse translational research. So with this introduction, it's now my privilege to introduce my colleague and co-global lead, Barbel Holbein, 
who will take us into the workforce and education element. Barbell is a colleague in the Global uh, Development Goal 7, as well as the Development Goal 11 group. She is working as a community pharmacist and has been uh, in an uh, industry pharmacist for 20 years. And she's lecturing and does research on innovation, access, access to innovation, and is guided by the principles of sustainability, diversity, and equity. Of this winter, she is lecturing Coronaceuticals, innovation in biopharmaceutical industry in the times of a pandemic and beyond. Barwell, thank you for being with us, and we are looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Marit. Thank you for the introduction, and thank you for having me. Hello to all the um, audience around the globe. So I will guide you through the thoughts of our DG7 team, um, Marit, Marwan, and I, our thoughts on advancing integration integrated services regarding the workforce and education element and later regarding the science element of DG7. The next slide, please, Gonzalez. Do you hear me? Yeah, thank you. So as Marit explained, um, advancing integrated services means taking the patient into the center, reflect the social determinants of health, and apply a needs-based approach, striving for success and sustainability. The next one, please. So we defined four mechanisms, the education and training on local healthcare systems, policies and strategies for workforce education, and evidence-based approaches to train the trainers, and then health equity and social determinants of health to promote, to be promoted, sorry, uh, by pharmaceutical workforce and the key stakeholders in the healthcare systems. The next, yeah, thank you. Um, to give you an idea about our thoughts regarding uh, the um, education and training we think there should be knowledge on the structure of the healthcare systems and moreover on the global healthcare system architectures. So how are the systems are financed? What about the resources? Which types of remuneration models are around? Um, do we speak about cost or do we speak about investments? What about the pharmacy demographics? Um, and um, there should be knowledge also about payers' willingness uh, to pay for these services. Um, we, I mentioned already the resources. Uh, we include also the workforce availability, and there should be knowledge about the wealth of the healthcare system uh, we are working in as pharmacists and pharmaceutical scientists. Yeah, and now in the pandemic, what are the learnings of the COVID-19 outbreak? Are the systems resilient? Are they prepared for, for the future? The next panelist, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Moreover, we think about um, knowledge on the role of pharmacists in the healthcare system. Is there anything beyond dispensing like first aid, primary care, disease screening and clinical decision making and pharmaceutical care? Pharmacy ownership believe that there should be knowledge on health service research and the research methods. And um, yeah, if it's possible, why not um, educate on health, drugs and vaccines as the public good nowadays, particularly in this pandemic. Thank you. The next slide, please, Gonzalez. Um, regarding the development of policies and strategies, uh, we believe that there should be first um, a clear understanding of the need 
within each local healthcare system. So we can do SWOT analysis or gap analysis and then develop strategies and set priorities. Um, colleagues should be able to compare their local healthcare system with other healthcare systems and compare services provided globally. Um, and, and strive for individual patient outcome. We would like to see um, that colleagues think beyond their own system, their local system, like a mission-oriented approach. And furthermore, there should be policies and strategies uh, striving for problem-solving skills and pharmacists and pharmaceutical scientists as decision-maker in pharmacotherapy. Thank you. The next slide. Yeah, when it comes to um, pharmaceutical workforce and um, key stakeholders, uh, we believe that there should be knowledge of all stakeholders within the healthcare system and their different perspectives. Knowledge and understanding of equity and access. What does it mean in the local healthcare system and what does it mean globally? knowledge of the social determinants of health and their domains. Yeah, and here I'd like to bridge back to what uh, Bob uh, explained already. Um, knowledge about patient engagement, patient centricity, uh, centricity, and having the patient as stakeholder. The next, please, Gonzalez. So what we as team can offer is a workforce reference guide, guide as of next year, we will have indicators and metrics and an autumn FIP offers a regional workshop uh, to develop regional roadmaps to develop uh, and to, to develop uh, the approaches within the development goals and also for advancing integrated services. The next one, our understanding is that um, some questions like the following ones should be addressed on a regional level because healthcare systems are really uh, different. And here we could address um, questions like which ed um, educational content do we need for the future and with which colleagues uh, should we adapt the policies? How do we educate and train on digitalization and structural change? What else do we need regarding leadership, hybrid working formats and logistics, for example? The next one. Also on a regional level, um, there should be a discussion where should we intervene in the healthcare system? What are the priorities? Do we need to improve? Where do we need to transform? What changes uh, do we face and how can we ensure more research on services? And how can we increase the awareness of pharmacists and pharmaceutical sciences in the healthcare system at a glance? Thank you so much. Thank you, Barbell, for taking us through um, the first component or the first element of this goal um, and really highlighting that the core of the service or the, where every service start is with a good and sound workforce and education. So thank you very much um, for your contribution. Let's move on now to the second element in this goal, which is then a practice element. And I'm very happy to introduce Lars Alke Sutherland. Um, he is absolutely familiar to all of you in the audience of FIP. Um, he's currently the president of the community pharmacy section of FIP. And he is also the co-chair of the FIP Congress Programming Committee. Lars, thank you very much for being with us and taking the time. And we're also very um, happy to have you and to learn more about the practice component when it comes to advising integrated services. Thank you. Thank you so very much uh, for your kind introduction, Mariette. Uh, let's move on to this slide. Yes, as you can see um, um, in this slide, actually, 
a people-centered and integrated healthcare provision that is based on an interprofessional and cross-setting seamless continuum, including pharmacies delivered professional services. This is the practice element of goal number seven. I will read it again. People-centered, integrated healthcare provision, interprofessional and cross-setting seamless continuum, and pharmacies delivered professional services. And the truth is that this sentence says it all because the people or the, uh, the patient is the, at the real center of the care. And we have an integrated healthcare provision, interprofessional collaboration, and seamless continuum pharmacies professional services. This is about real collaboration and cooperation between all the stakeholders and with the patient and not about the patient. Gone is the paternalistic view of healthcare. And here is the healthcare model where the individual is an equal partner. Next slide, please. In this slide, you can see the different uh, mechanisms uh, for the practice element, seven mechanisms. Define clear processes and procedures, develop and implement systems for the design, delivery, and evaluation of such services, recognize that people-centered, integrated quality health services are the foundation for optimal clinical, humanistic, economic, and sustainable healthcare outcomes. Clearly identify patient and population needs, ensure capacity to deliver, deliver interprofessional integrated services and ensure collaborative working with others within the pharmacy team and other healthcare providers, especially through the transitions of care and implement quality measures of all outcomes of healthcare, of course. Let's uh, look at the next slide, please. If we try to center services around the patient, this means that a number of services can be available for the patient and in many different settings, depending on where the patient is. And the management and delivery of health services should be designed so that people receive a continuum of services through the different levels and sites of care within the healthcare system and according to their needs. Next slide, please. As we can see here, in many countries, aging populations and the growing burden of long-term chronic illness and multiple morbidities cause different healthcare systems to struggle to effectively meet the rising demands for care. And what we can see here is that actually we have a number of design systems. We have decision support for doctors and pharmacists and other healthcare professionals, information systems, and also the process of sales management, of course. But depending on the situation of the patient, this leads to different services um, that can be offered to the patient and where the outcome is to improve quality, continuity of care and efficiency, efficiency and to create a very sustainable healthcare system. So let's look um, uh, at the next um, slide, please. So as you can see, uh, I think it's really important that pharmacy is an integrated actor within the national health strategy or medicines strategy in every country. Because if it's not there, and if it's not written, it actually uh, doesn't exist. So successful integration will ensure that healthcare services throughout the continuum of care of, is of acceptable quality. That means effective, safe, and people-centered. And integrated health services based on strong primary care and public health functions directly contribute to better distribution of health outcomes and enhancing well-being and quality of life which in turn bring important economic, social, and individual benefits. So integrated care services actually contributes to improved access to services, fewer unnecessary hospitalizations and readmissions, better adherence to treatment, increased patient satisfaction, health literacy, and self-care and greater job satisfaction for health workers as well, and overall improved health outcomes. As such, I think it's really important that pharmacy is included in every national health strategy. Next slide, please. Healthcare consists mainly of three core processes. 
the strategic or the administrative process, the core process of care, and many different support, support processes. And in this perspective from the health system, pharmacy today can be considered as a support process. But once a patient is given or prescribed a medicine, pharmacy automatically becomes an integrated actor of the core process, as you can see in the middle. And do you know that eight out of 10 consultations in primary care actually leads to prescription medicine. And as a medicine is an investment in health, it is our obligation to optimize the effect of this investment. Because when medicines are not used appropriately, they directly become a cost. And in order to support both the healthcare system and our patients, our services need to be integrated into this core process. I think it's pretty clear, and I would say there is no doubt about it, that pharmacy is an integrated actor within our health systems, even if our politicians haven't discovered it yet. Next slide, please. So this is exactly what the WHO and UNICEF says. They define primary health care as a whole of society approach to maximize the level and distribution of health and well being by acting simultaneously on three components primary care and essential public health functions as the core of integrated health services, multi sectoral policy and action, and empowerment of people and communities. And this means that we need to develop health strategies with people at the center implement transformation and transform pharmacy so that we can support both the health system and our patients according to their new and changing needs. And by this, we can actually enable a sustained change, including workforce issues, digital health, rearrange accountability, and promote the responsible use of medicines, etc. Next slide, please. So, uh, to effectively implement the first component, this requires an understanding of how to effectively integrate health services. And the integrated health services responds to the needs of the individuals and populations and can actually deliver comprehensive good quality services throughout the life course through multidisciplinary teams who work together across settings and use evidence and feedback loops to continuously improve performance. So in this slide, you can see the Kambaya Shanga project from South Africa. This project combines the skills of the pharmacists, the resource of a global biopharmaceutical company, a training platform, the technology and telehealth, and the referral network to the general practitioners to provide this unique asthma program. And in South Africa, this is the first of many intervention models for patients that attempt to better manage chronic conditions as South Africa progress towards universal health coverage. Next slide, please. People-centered integrated quality health services are the foundation for optimal clinical, humanistic, economic, and sustainable healthcare outcomes. And these examples highlight the need to integrate the patient as an ambassador of their own health. This was my own project for 10 years in Sweden. It's called Check My Medicines or called Polekemedel. It has significantly improved therapy outcomes significantly increased health literacy among patients and supporting doctors to prescribe the appropriate medication for elderly. And as such, at the national level, inappropriate medications for elderly has been reduced by 60%, six serum. And as such, having a very positive effect on outcomes, readmissions, health literacy, and in making the patient an equal partner in healthcare. And part of this project and how we empower patients uh, is actually available in six different languages on our website. Next slide, please. This can also be shown in this uh, slide or model uh, as it entails the key components in optimizing the therapy for the elderly. The right medicine to the right patient at the right time, patient support programs, monitoring to follow up, uh, reduced number of readmissions, and of course, improved benefits uh, from the medicines. Next slide, please. 
Of course, the COVID-19 pandemic or crisis has tested resilience and agility of all health systems in an unprecedented way. The crisis has cast light on strength as well as weaknesses, and in several cases, lack of preparedness, equipment, and infrastructure to deal with an event of these proportions. But the pandemic has also highlighted great solidarity, inventiveness, and resilience, not least on the part of the health workforce, such as pharmacists, which has led the way in fighting the pandemic on the ground. And ultimately, the crisis has reminded us about the crucial importance of health and well-being for our societies, that health threats now uh, have no, no borders and that these challenges can only be faced if we work together across borders and across sectors. And pharmacy has been essential for all during the crisis. Next slide, please. And as such, we have also developed a great number of services during the crisis in order to support our patients and protect the vulnerable patients, as well as including pharmacies in national campaigns, for example, testing and vaccinations against COVID-19. Next slide, please. So um, collaborative working with others within the pharmacy team and other healthcare providers, especially during uh, or through transitions of care and lifespan care is of course essential. We need to follow and support the patient on his or her journey through the healthcare system. And we also need to collaborate more, for example, with hospital pharmacists. And this is, I think, very important uh, in order to prevent, um, for example, readmissions. Next slide, please. Several FIP reports are very useful in this perspective. For example, the gateway to care, the fight against uh, non-communicable diseases, and recently medicines reconciliation and medicine use reviews. These documents are uh, possible to download from the FIP webpage and extremely useful in our effort to develop um, integrated services. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide shows um, 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 some very important criteria for people-centered care. And we also saw some examples from New Zealand. And you can see comprehensive, equitable, sustainable, coordinated, continuous, holistic, preventive, empowering, goal-oriented. And next slide, please. Uh, respectful collaborative, co-produced, endowed with rights and responsibilities, governed through shared accountability, evidence-informed, uh, led by whole system thinking, ethical, etc. And next slide, please. And of course, the most inclusive care is lived experience expertise. And that means our patients' voice to listen to the patient and healthcare expertise will actually provide us with safe and more inclusive care. And next slide, please. And of course, it's really important to uh, focus on quality. It's an essential component in care and so for pharmacy. And here are some holistic quality measures. And on the next slide, we can see even some more. Um, and of course, these can be adapted also to the individual patient uh, and being targeted for each intermediate patient according to their needs. I think that key is that pharmacy should be part of the patient's care plan because community pharmacy is one established primary care provider with the potential to improve access for patients and relieve pressures on general practice. So community pharmacy will have an even bigger role in urgent care and prevention post COVID-19. And this means that new services will be introduced over the coming years, which will integrate with other primary care settings through integrated referral pathways. And as the role of community pharmacy continues to expand, the need for ensuring high quality services meeting patients' need and integration, integrating across patient primary care pathways has never been greater before. And in this perspective, I think it's also necessary that we try to develop quality indicators for community pharmacy as our role within healthcare will be even stronger. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Lars Alke, for um, sharing this practice component um, or practice 
side of things when we look at integrated services um, and how to advance it. Um, and you showed us so many examples. Um, I really think uh, you, you enlightened us with your presentation. So thank you so much for also being with us um, and giving some of your time. And um, the last element then on this uh, advancing integrated services is then to look at the science component. So I'll hand back again to my colleague Barwell as she will take us through this um, element as well. Thank you, colleague. Thank you. Gonzalez, can you take the next slide, please? Yeah, thank you. You know, the science element deals with strategies on expanded pharmacy services, ex scientific strategies for the evaluation of expanded pharmacy services and translational and reverse translational research. Can I have the next slide, please? Yeah, the next one, please. So the three mechanisms are on evidence, on research, and on collaboration and interprofessionalism needed to advance integrated services. And uh, not to stay abstract, um, I will give you some examples um, of our thoughts within the team. So the next slide, please, Gonzalez. So we think about scientific strategies on and health service research in community settings and in interprofessional settings, which means research on the impact pharmacists have in a broader health care team. Furthermore, uh, we think about why not running a patient engagement analysis. I bridge back to what Lars and Bob said, uh, taking the patient in the center. And what about research on pharmacist-driven health gains and outcome gains, research on pharmaceutical care concepts, and the science of transformation and translation uh, to our profession? Yeah, thank you. This is a science part. Thank you very much, Barval. Um, and definitely, this is so much opportunity to link um, the practice setting with evidence based and the science. Um, and I know that you are also involved in development goal 11, which focus on the impact of the profession, um, which I think is very valuable in this case, when we talk about science. And um, everybody that's maybe interested, the Development Goal 7 webinar will actually be hosted in December. So be sure to sign up for that event as well. Our next speaker now um, is Jacqueline Chiru. She's the Vice President of FIP. She was previously the President of the Hospital Pharmacy Section. She's currently chairing the FIP Pharmaceutical Technology Forum, and she is the FIP Liaison Officer for the African Pharmaceutical Forum. So Jacqueline, thank you for being with us, and we're also looking forward to your presentation in taking us further on this topic. Thank you. Thank you, Mariette, for this kind words, for an introduction. So the topic is about electronic health record. And uh, I thought it was important to give a definition of an electronic health record because it varies uh, according to different countries. And by the way, we have a semantic uh, uh, problem, if I can say so, because uh, uh, electronic health uh, record, it's more about disease. And so we should more talk about disease record than health record. Anyhow, the ele electronic health record is a collection of health information on the patient in a digital format. And this digital format is designed in a way that it is capable of being shared across healthcare providers. This is a key concept. It gathers health information from all the clinicians which are involved, who are involved in the patient's care. And it is a key component which enables a real and effective collaboration between members uh, of the healthcare team and as well of the other healthcare providers. So uh, EHR 
are a vital part of the health IT within the health information system. So in the next slide, we are going to see uh, what the electronic health record contains. It contains health issues, of course, symptoms, clinical data, clinical documents, diagnosis, and progress notes on the uh, disease. It also contains the patient medication, medical history and past medical history, which contains itself the medication history we're going to talk about a bit later. It contains the lab test results, the radiology images and reports, the exploration test, of course, the treatment, drug therapy, also the allergies of the patient, immunization status. It also gathers all the digital exchanges between healthcare professionals about the patient, and also add some administrative data and, and the, the demographic data. And in some uh, countries, it also includes the billing. A notion, a notion that I want to stress on that in some, some countries, the electronic health record contains the mention of the patient's reference pharmacist, which is usually the community pharmacist where the patient used to go. So it's a pharmacist who is the most uh, aware of the patient uh, condition. Uh, in the next uh, um, slide, thank you for the next slide. Uh, I have uh, uh, stressed the uh, items that the pharmacist should uh, have the right to access to perform his clinical activities. Clinical activities like prescription analysis, medication history, medication reconciliation, patient counseling, pharmaceutical advice. For all this, the pharmacist should be able to access the medication history, which is a part of the, the medical history, so including the past medical history. He should be able to access the lab test results, of course, the treatment, the drug therapy with all the posology and so on. He should be uh, able to know if the patient has, is an allergic patient, also, if uh, the immunization status, and with the COVID-19, this is a special focus on that. And of course, uh, if the billing is, uh, is uh, involved, then of course, the pharmacist will be also involved in the billing. And uh, as a must, uh, he will have access to the reference pharmacies. He can call uh, reference pharmacists, community pharmacists, especially this is important for us in hospital, I'm a hospital pharmacist, then when we can call the pharmacist, the community colleague, uh, to have some more information on the patient. Next. So um, we have seen all the advantages of uh, uh, electronic health records, the many advantages and many benefits. Uh, this has already be, been stressed, especially by, by Lasoke in his presentation. Um, it, it is uh, really a key component. It helps the patient's information to be in one, one, one place. From multiple source, it's stored electronically in one place. And this uh, helps to retrieve it quickly to save time. It avoids also, also paper cost. Um, it is a comprehensive patient-centered health information record, and this helps for accurate diagnosis and well-informed care de decisions. Uh, it is uh, accessible 24-7, so it's real-time patient information. It allows quick and timely clinical decisions, and it avoids redundant tests. It is shared information across all the healthcare providers, uh, like uh, labor pharmacists, laboratory, emergency care specialists, but also across different healthcare settings like hospital, nursing homes, community pharmacies, of, of course. So this helps to decrease care fragmentation and uh, improve healthcare coordination and uh, ultimately seamless care transition is there. And also it provides access to the evidence-based tool for clinical decision 
which helps for better clinical decisions and uh, high quality care. And as we have seen, it all also automates and streamlines provider workflow, enhances equity, privacy, and security. Globally, uh, the electronic health record improve care, reduce safety risk, reduce costs, and finally, for better patients' outcome. So, of course, all this is ideal, but uh, in real life, it's a bit different. This is what we can see in the next slide. The next slide, I presented it in Buenos Aires in, uh, in um, uh, 2016, um, just to show how the information circulates between all the healthcare providers and, and healthcare settings. Uh, the, for instance, the, uh, the, the, the pharmacy software, and we have, in, uh, we have several software in France, but we have mostly the DP, Dossier Pharmaceutique, you may have heard of it, uh, doesn't uh, always talk with the GP software, which does not talk with the nursing home software, which will not talk with the software of the next hospital, local hospital, not obviously with the, the, the university hospital next to it. So it, it is a very complicated thing. And this, is, why is that so? It's usually because of a lack of interoperability. A lack of interoperability, meaning that information does not uh, flow fluidly from one setting to another. The softwares do not talk to each other, and they are not. And even if they can exchange information, they cannot use the information they have exchanged. And this is terrible. It's even happened in uh, in different hospitals between several hospitals. Uh, even if a hospital A has a software the same software than hospital B, there is a problem of version. So if the version of the software is not the same, then it doesn't work. The exchange doesn't work. It's a versioning problem. We call it versioning problem. And experts in uh, uh, IT very elegantly always talk about the digital environment. And it's because of the digital environment that the uh, flow of uh, of information is not fluid. Uh, in the hospital, we are very often within a, a one hospital, a specialized software. Like in my hospital, we have a software for operating theater, another software with the ICU or with the neonates, but this software do not talk to each other. So uh, it is, and uh, I showed that next slide, uh, also in, uh, in Buenos Aires, it is exactly as if those uh, different settings were closed, like in silos, and we are talking about silos, the silos we have in agriculture, you know, it's the same, the, the, the information is there and doesn't circulate. Next slide. So um, here comes uh, integration of care, uh, we have a a beautiful presentation from Bob about what integration of care means. Um, I, won't, <laughs> I won't tell it about, but I will just say in a, in a nutshell that integration of care addresses fragmentation in pharmacy in um, patient services. Integration is a, um, should, must be seen as a set of methods, processes and models that seek to bring together parts of the healthcare delivery system that traditionally work in silos. And I want to mention this report from WHO, which addresses uh, integration care models. It enables uh, a coordinated uh, continuum of care. Integration is greater efficiency, greater value from healthcare delivery system. And it is especially important at transitions of care. And within this integration of care, uh, EHR has a pivotal position in the healthcare integration process. Next slide. So to uh, succeed in the integration of care, there is one thing, one first step which must be done. It is reaching interoperability for systems to exchange information and use the information 
their exchange. And to reach interoperability, there is a need for interoperable standards. And I have mentioned here the famous, more fam famous interoperability standards, HL7, maybe you've heard about HL7, which is a, a standard which is recognized all over the world. And now a new standard which is appearing and we are working on it presently, it's standard FIRE. So it is so important that in the statement of policy on digital health that we have elaborated within the uh, FIP technology forum that I am chairing, we have put an advocacy for this common standards on the first recommendations of each target groups. The advocacy for common digital standards and common terminology. It's the only way up to my eyes to facilitate health information exchange among countries and at a global level and succeed in integration of care. It is according to the DG7, it is also according to the DG20, and it is according to the one FIP strategy. Thank you very much. Mariette, we don't hear you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jacqueline. Um, and thank you for sharing um, the important component of electronic health records um, to the audience as also part of this integrated um, service provision. Um, a quick panel discussion, giving the time allowing us. Um, we have a question um, in the Q&A section that I would like to read out. Um, and it might be, um, you know, our, our speakers have shared um, the great potential with integrated health services. Um, but what do we do in the unfortunate situation where there is uh, identification of medication errors? what would be the impact of then conveying the reality of uh, medication errors to our colleagues in the multidisciplinary team, for instance, the medical doctors, what would the impact be then on something like an integrated service? Maybe Bob, would you like to start us off and then maybe Lars, Barbell and Jacqueline could add to that? Certainly, I'll, I'll be a pleasure to start off. I think um, something that I've seen is, is medication errors and prescribing errors is something that uh, community pharmacists, well, hospital pharmacists too, often identify. And so there, there is a need, a safety need to communicate that with the prescriber. And at a, at a very basic level, that can be sometimes for some relationships, the only thing the pharmacist contacts the doctor about. And so we, we have our our, our term in New Zealand is a, is a pharmacy police because we're policing the prescription. Um, but in a more integrated sense, the, the errors that are occurring or the, the issues that are occurring can be, can be discussed as a team and see where, where the trends are happening. Is it the information that's coming through about the, the medication um, when they at the point of prescribing? Is it um, the, the management of care and what is the best um, evidence-based care for that at the time? and uh, it can allow the group to be able to work through those types of issues, I would think, in a, in a more integrated sense. Lars, would you like to add to that? Yes, I think uh, actually we have to remind ourselves and also our healthcare uh, colleagues, uh, why do we exist? Well, we do exist for the patient. And that means that we need to get away from the silo thinking and actually work together because um, post-COVID-19, uh, uh, actually our patients are demanding this, that we collaborate. And now we can't go back to what we had before. We need to create a new, new normal. And that means that we need to collaborate. And as such, um, I mean, we don't act as policemen when we say to a doctor that uh, this uh, medication in, is not appropriate. And if we look at the project we have been running for 10 years in Sweden, uh, Check My Medicine, it takes time to make the sustainable changes. 
but of course it is in everyone's interest to make the best for every patient. And as such, we have been collaborating with the doctors and we on our website, publish recommendations how to prescribe appropriately for, for example, elderly. And by that, doing the right thing from the beginning instead of uh, taking care of the quality deficits afterwards. So definitely it is possible, but we have to bear in mind that it might take some time, but we can't give up. We need to uh, continue to fight for the patient and for the people. Thank you. Very important point. Barbell, anything to add from your perspective? Yeah, I'd like to make it simple um, by asking a question. Why not making the patient get engaged here? That we work, uh, when it comes to this uh, example, in a triangle. The patient, the prescriber and the pharmacist. Thank you, Barbell. Um, very important thing to uh, think about is always bringing that patient in. Um, Jacqueline, would you like to end this discussion off maybe with a unique perspective? Yes, I think uh, everything has been said, but I would stress uh, in hospital, we have those <coughs> meeting structure that when we, we focus on a problem and try to solve it. And I would like to stress uh, on the aspect of collaboration, but also on multi-professional. It's very important to have all the different healthcare professions in one, which are involved in, in one single problem. And in this frame, the patient may be invited to participate. So we must always stay open. Yep. Thank you very much. Um, colleagues, thank you so much um, for maybe giving us a different perspective um, from your different expertise um, on this very important point that is a reality for all of us. Um, and Lars, as you've mentioned, we should always be working towards how to minimize that. So I really like the approach that you shared on maybe publicly sharing tips on how to minimize that a great approach. Colleagues, we are getting to the end of our webinar, um, but there's a very important component that we have not addressed yet, and that is the monitoring and evaluation when it comes to advancing integrated services. So up next, I would like to introduce uh, Mr. Chris John. He's from the FIP Global Pharmaceutical Observat Ob Observatory, and he will quickly take us through um, some monitoring and evaluation information in this regard. Thank you. Thank you, Marriott. Hello, everyone. If we move to the next slide, please, you'll see, yes, we are talking about the monitoring and evaluation of Development Goal 7. Next slide, please. Key to that monitoring and evaluation is the FIP Global Pharmaceutical Observatory, the mission of which centres around data, intelligence, advocacy and reporting. We know the importance of data and for data to provide us with evidence and for evidence to provide us with intelligence. So our first task is to collate valid global data on workforce, education, practice and pharmaceutical science. And we will do this for development goal seven. We must undertake comprehensive analysis of collated data to provide accessible, high quality intelligence. And all this must be communicated innovatively to promote our member organization's impact on health. This communication will often be via the FIP Atlas, which is our visualization platform for displaying our intelligence across the globe. And finally, we will provide evidence-based strategic information reports and guidance on the application of pharmaceutical science policies, practices, and services. We move to the next slide, please. As we are running short of time, I'm not going to go through all of this, but you'll see that the outputs and inferences of the GPO are on the screen in front of you. Uh, and the key thing we're here today to look at is health systems strengthening by tracking progress against the development goals. And today it's development goal seven. If we move to the next slide. Thank you. These are the current Global Pharmaceutical Observatory actions and projects. Again, because of time, I won't go through them all in great detail, but we have a multinational education and training needs assessment project, which is collating a lot of information about 
education and training needs across a cohort of 26 nations. I've mentioned the Atlas dashboards where we will display data for each development goal in a very innovative, innovative way. We're building a GPO microsite and have built a database for the secure holding of all our data. And we have a data and intelligence commission uh, running, which is all our, our key experts and advisors who guide us on the strategic direction of the observatory. And a key piece of work, and why we're here today, is our project on development goal indicators and how we develop tools to monitor and evaluate the development goal, and in the instance today, development goal seven. Next slide, please. So we're very keen to get your help on how we do this, how we monitor and evaluate Development Goal 7. We need your help and expertise. And um, we have a brief activity, a brief engaging activity, which will only take a few minutes, that will help us develop these indicators and metrics to measure and monitor progress for the implementation of Development Goal 7. So you can participate in this short activity by either clicking on the link in the slide in front of you, or you can scan the QR code. It'd be great if you could do that now. As I say, it only takes a few minutes and um, it will really help FIP to develop indicators and country level metrics to measure and monitor progress and performance of the implementation of FIP Development Goal 7. So your expertise will be, we will be very grateful for it. You'll also receive an email to complete this activity after the event if you don't get a chance to complete it during the event. So please do have a look and let us know what you think. It's just a few um, boxes that you have to tick and let us know your views. Okay, that's all I had to say. Thank you so much and have a good day. Thank you, Chris. Um, indeed, great work that you are doing. And I know from my position in South Africa, it's, it's exceptionally that information that really position us also um, as pharmacists in South Africa to use that global information when we do our advocacy work with our National Department of Health. So thank you very much. And colleagues, the link to this survey was also just posted in the chat um, if you would like to access this there. So colleagues, this is bringing us to the end of this webinar. But before we go, I would like to um, invite you to the next webinar in this series, which will be in the next slide, episode 12, where we will focus on development goal two, which is the early career training um, strategies. That will take place on the 1st of September um, at 11 o'clock Central European Standard Time. Uh, Gonzo, you can just move that slide forward um, and another one. Then our colleagues can just see the information there. Thank you. Then colleagues, also very important, um, moving to the next slide, is that when we approach September, it's important that we will celebrate World Pharmacist Day on the 25th of September. This year, the theme, more important than ever, is that pharmacy is always trusted for your health. So you can also be part of um, the campaign in the build up to our World Pharmacist Day. And it will just take a few simple steps to design this image for yourself and then to share it on social media platforms and where you go everywhere so that we can also as a profession celebrate this important day um, for us. And this year would be the 11th year that we share and celebrate this wonderful day. So colleagues, if you want to access any further or future FIP digital events, there's a wide range. You can access them at events.fip.org. Um, the range of topics include antimicrobial resistance, um, non-communicable diseases, vaccination, FIP development goals like this episode, patient safety, prevention, and many, many more. So to see all the upcoming events, you can visit the website and you can register in advance for those upcoming events. I would also like to thank our speakers who made um, this event so rememberable. Um, I'm starting off with Bob Buckham, then with my colleague Barbel Holbein, Lars Alka-Sudeland, and Jacqueline Shurouk, 
And then finally, also Chris John from FIP sharing on the monitoring and evaluation. Colleagues, thank you for sharing your afternoon with us. Take care, and be blessed, stay safe, stay strong, and we welcome you back at the next webinar event. Have a great day. Goodbye.